This is Carol Baskin and this is Cat Chat 36. Today with me is Jennifer Dietz. She is an adjunct professor at the Animal, Animal Law Seminar, Stetson University College of Law from 2008 till present. She is a founding member of the Senior Partner of Animal Law Attorneys, a law firm dedicated to the practice of animal law. She's a founding member of Florida Bar's Animal Law Committee. She is a two-time chair of the Animal Law Committee of the Florida Bar for the years 2006 to 2007 and 2007 to 2008. She is a recipient of the Distinguished Leadership Award in Education provided by the SPCA of Tampa Bay, which is where I think I met you. Yes. She is an attorney member for the Animal Legal Defense Fund for eight years and a treasurer of the Executive Council of the Florida Bar General Practice Solo and Small Firm Section 2012 to 2013. Welcome, Jennifer Dietz. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, Carol. Um, I actually practice animal law and I teach animal law, which I love. Um, I was an English teacher before I went to law school and uh, now I get to do what I love to do, which is practice animal law and also teach animal law uh, at Stetson University College of Law. Uh, the practice of animal law has really evolved over the past 20 years. 20 years ago, you would not know that there was such a thing as animal law. And now, 126 schools, law schools in the United States have animal law courses. And there's also the Animal Legal Defense Fund, which was founded 20 years ago. And it now has over 2,000 uh, members, uh, attorney members. Uh, it's a wonderful group. And then I ended up teaching animal law. I've been teaching for six years at Stetson. Uh, and each year my class gets bigger and bigger because more students are interested in animal law. My goal in life is to make sure that animal, that we get more animal lawyers out there and that uh, we get more practicing animal lawyers so that the general public have people to go to when they have an issue with their animals. And on that note, there are so many animal issues uh, that you wouldn't think of, but they're actually out there. Um, and I thought today I would give you some of my interesting cases and talk a little bit about those um, so that your audience um, will know about the animal law issues should they come up in their life. Um, and I'll start off with my first animal law case. And, um, and I, how long ago was that? That would be eight years ago now. Wow. Yeah, eight years. It's a long time. You're a pioneer. I was a pioneer. That's what people say that I, I pioneered it. Um, there, I have to let you know there are four animal law attorneys in the state of Florida, um, but none practice solely in the area of animal law. Most practice in environmental law or personal injury and animal law or something along those lines because that's their bread and butter. Animal law does not pay a lot of money, but it, you do it because it's, you feel, um, it, it makes you feel very good to do animal law and to help the animals and, and their owners also. So the first case I had eight years ago was called the Blue Paw case, um, and it was a small puppy that had just been brought home from the, um, the uh, puppy store, and um, which I'm not a fan of. <laughs> so this is like puppy mill puppy. It was, puppy yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. It was a puppy mill puppy, which I am very much against puppy mills, and uh, I hope one day they're all eradicated. And uh, so I, I hope people always get their animals for anim from animal services or from rescue groups. So this young puppy comes home. The family had their videotape running because they're so excited about their animal being there. And this beautiful little puppy's running through the backyard and having a great time. And they bring the puppy inside and they notice that his paws are wet and they're blue. And they couldn't figure out why the animal's paws were blue. And it turns out that um, they, they finally, after a few days, figured out that they should call their, um, their pest control service, which sprays their lawn. And they had specifically said, please don't spray our backyard. Unfortunately, they did. The puppy's paws got blue. Um, and then the puppy died less than a year later of kidney failure. Mm. 
And so it didn't take too much logic to put together that the pesticide in the backyard killed this poor puppy. So the owners called me and uh, we decided to file a lawsuit against the owner of the, uh, the company, uh, the, the um, pest control company and the manufacturer of the pest control, it's of the pesticide itself. Wow. Now what happened was... That's um, taking on the big dog. That is taking <laughs> on the big dog, exactly. And um, the manufacturer and the pesticide company decided to settle with my client because they don't want their names out there in a public lawsuit or in the newspaper. And so they decided to uh, settle the case. Um, it was confidential, um, so I, I'm not allowed to say how much it settled for, but it did settle for a great deal of money. Now when I say a great deal of money, it's more than the market value of that puppy, which is the typical amount of money that owners receive when something happens to their animal. Market value means the cost of the animal. So if you had a purebred golden retriever that cost you $800 to purchase and the animal died due to the negligence of others, you would only get $800. Wow. And that's, that's, nothing. that's nothing to, the, to a family uh, that owns that beautiful animal and that becomes a part of the family. And if you get a dog from animal services like I do and my cats, um, they generally cost $20 to $30. Mm -hmm. And if somebody was negligent and did something wrong to my animal, I would want more money than that. I would want to show that person, don't do this again. Mm -hmm. uh, but the people with the blue paw puppy decided um, that they wanted to go full force and they uh, actually got the media involved and they decided to settle the case for more than the market value of the pet um, because of different business reasons. Um, like I said, they don't want the bad publicity. So if that was your first case and it was like eight years ago, were there not laws that would enable them to recover more at that time for their animal? Absolutely. So that's why they had to take it to the press to make it more of a painful process so that they could. Exactly. They, there were no laws on the books where you could get more than the market value of the pet. There are states that allow you to get more than the market value of the pet in a negligence case with an animal. One of those is Illinois, which allows up to $25,000 for the negligent uh, injury or destruction of an animal. And the other one is Tennessee, which also allows up to $25,000 and also allows attorney's fees, which means that your attorney who helped you with your pet case receives their attorney's fees paid by the, the person who injured the animal. So those are good statutes and those help attorneys because attorney's fees in these types of cases are very minimal for the uh, animal law practitioner. We're hoping that those types of statutes do finally go to other states. They were very hard to enact because there was a big lobby against it, um, obviously. That would be the people, uh, such as the veterinarians, because of um, the suits that come be about veterinarians, uh, product liability uh, people, because of the products that animals use and die from, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Some of the other lobbyists would be the pet food um, um, manufacturers. Yeah because of the pet food, uh, the tainted pet food, which caused the death of uh, many hundreds of animals uh, several years ago. So they would be against that type of uh, enactment of statute where you would get that much money and you'd get attorney's fees paid. So on the one hand, you've got all of these really you know, high paid, well-funded organizations that are fighting these kinds of laws. And on the other hand, you have who? Who is fighting for to get animal? Because there aren't that many there animal aren't that attorneys. Many. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be the very few animal law attorneys, but there would be groups like the Humane Society, PETA, SPCA, the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and other such organizations that are uh, out there to help the animals and their owners. And so they would be part of the lobby. The lobbying group uh, won, obviously, in Illinois and Tennessee to get these statutes uh, passed. 
Uh, part of my job in the future will be to try and get a statute passed for the state of Florida. And, and we will be there right behind you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that would be terrific. Um, so the blue paw uh, puppy really showed how there are so many different areas of law that um, touch animal law. Uh, for instance, if you have a custody dispute, a lot of folks are in, uh, know about custody disputes because of their, of their children or their friends' children whose family may have uh, had a divorce and they have to decide about where the children, um, the best interest of the child. Well, with uh, animals, when a couple breaks up or a married couple breaks up, who gets the dog or the cat? And the courts have said, we will not touch that. You have to take care of that on your own. Well, families, most uh, husbands and wives and boyfriends and girlfriends will not come to a decision on the custody of the animal, and they will go to trial. Mm -hmm. And so I take the, uh, I usually end up with the client who has the best ownership interest in the animal, the highest right of ownership in the animal. And I'll give you a, for instance, a young man came to me and said that he hadn't seen his Yorkshire Terrier in a year. And I said, did you purchase this Yorkshire Terrier? And he said, yes. And I said, uh, well, let's get that Yorkshire Terrier back for you. Now, he fed that Yorkshire Terrier, walked the Terrier, um, uh, got his microchip in his name, and things like that. It all added up to great facts for my client. We went to trial, and the judge said, yes, you do have the right of ownership to this dog. And he, he had not seen the dog in about a year and a half now because of the trial. And uh, he saw the dog the next day, and it was I was there. It was wonderful oh. for him to get his dog back. Oh my goodness. So it was just terrific. And, you know, so many times I'm assuming in those kinds of situations, people use the animals just like pawns. And to hurt oh, yeah. the other partner, just like they do with their children. Absolutely. And that's exactly what happened in this case. It was a, a boyfriend who moved on to a different girlfriend. The girlfriend was upset, stole the puppy from the house that they had once shared. She knew how to get in. She took the puppy, uh, the little Yorkshire Terrier, and that was that. And But in the end, like I say, most times justice prevails. So that was very good mm -hmm. for the for the owners. Um, there's another interesting case where uh, it's on YouTube and it has to do with two dogs who were shot uh, 14 times in a pasture uh, because they got loose from their owner. The owner is a very nice man. Uh, he is British. He became my client when he told me that his two dogs were shot uh, point blank range in a uh, pasture in Orlando. And I said, well, why would someone shoot them? And he said he believed that the person who shot them thought that they were wolves and that they were attacking the cattle. Well, we all know there's not, there are no wolves in Florida. And so um, they were actually Siberian Huskies. So this man who shot them um, had gained the permission of the landowner and the owner of the cattle to shoot the dogs. So it wasn't even the owner of the cattle. No, it was not the owner of the cattle. It was not the owner of the pasture land. It was just a, a someone that was going by in their car and saw two dogs playing in the water near the cattle. And so uh, he got out of his car. He knew the person who owned the land, uh, a very wealthy family in Orlando, called them, and they said, well, sure, if they're wolves, you, you should shoot them. They'll, they'll hurt our, our animals, our, our cows. So he went into the pasture, and luckily, a lady from um, Scotland was uh, on a, a trip in Orlando, and she actually took the videotape of this happening, which is so fortuitous for us that she did this. And unfortunately, it shows the animals being shot. The good 14 times. 14 times with crazy. two guns, oh. two separate guns, two separate pistols, I should say. And then he went um, and my owner uh, client went over and begged him to stop shooting them. And he didn't. He kept shooting them. <sighs> and again, it's all on videotape. And the, um, uh, we took it to trial. And the owner um, of, my, of the dogs settled the case and then promptly moved back to England because it was so 
heartbreaking. The dogs lived. One dog had his eye uh, permanently removed because of a, a gunshot to the wound to the eye, and the other had a uh, still has a bullet near the spine and has to be watched regularly so that it doesn't move and cause paralyzation of the back uh, two legs. Wow. Yeah. So uh -huh. you never know what's going to happen when I, you know when I pick up my phone, I never know what's going to be on the other end of that <laughs> of what the call is going to be about. Um, I do work with um, special needs people who need uh, emotional support dogs, and a lot of times condominiums and homeowners associations will say you can't have that dog in this area because it's too big. Uh, we don't allow dogs, and so I have to educate the homeowners and the condo association that they are not allowed to keep the animal from the premises if it is, in fact, an emotional support dog um, or a service dog. And what defines an emotional support dog or a service dog? How do you, how do you sure. make that case? Okay. Uh, a service dog is an animal that a doctor has said uh, provides a service to the person such as hearing uh, or seeing um, if the person is blind. So we all know about guide dogs. Uh, but there are other types of dogs that help the person in case they're going to have a seizure and the dog alerts them to the seizure. Things that aren't noticeable but the dog uh, is there for, those, for that help. Uh, for instance, a little girl who needs help with walking, she leans on a, a large dog and it helps her to walk because she has um, cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was one of my cases, and we had an issue with the Homeowners Association, which we, we did resolve in favor of the little girl and her family to keep the dog. Mm -hmm. Now, one that is interesting is the service animal that is for an emotional support. Now, emotional support dogs, you don't normally see what's wrong with the person, what their issue is. And so my job is to show that they're suffering from some sort of PTSD um, or they have some sort of um, issue where they need uh, the help. Maybe they have anxiety and the dog helps to release the anxiety from them and they get to be uh, more sociable. Now those animals used to be any type of animal until the statute changed in Florida and it could no longer be a python, it couldn't <laughs> be a kitten, it couldn't be a horse, it has to be a dog. And so, so emotional um, support animals are dogs. Um, and uh, Because there were some people trying to get away with pigs and having them on the plane and all sorts of things, uh, which is an actual case. And so um, the, uh, I did help a, a young man with PTSD uh, get to have his service emotional support animal um, to live at his condominium with him. Uh, it did take a lawsuit, uh, but we had to, to get through that and of course the judge ruled in our favor because it was a dog, it was an emotional support dog, and the owner had a doctor's note stating that the, this gentleman needed an emotional support dog. So it's not just people saying, well, I need this for emotional support. They've got a doctor's note or they have some existing condition that yes. warrants it. They have some existing condition, and the only question that the people can ask, such as the homeowners association or the condo association, is, do you have a uh, disability, and how does this animal help you with this disability? They do not have to tell the uh, the owner of the animal does not have to disclose what disability they have mm -hmm. because that breaks the HIPAA laws, mm -hmm. which protect you from having to disclose medical conditions to people who are not doctors. So that was a very interesting case. Um, another case um, I have, I, I do get a lot of veterinarian malpractice cases, probably one a week. Um, and what happens wow. is... Wow. Yes. One um, a week. One, once a week I get a call about Ooh. a vet malpractice case. And it's not that vets are bad. I love veterinarians. I think they do a fantastic job and have a great calling in life. But if it's egregious enough, I will take the case, um, and we do it twofold. Once, um, one part of it is for the Department of Professional and Business Regulations, and that uh, regulates veterinarians. And so we send off a complaint to them, which is not a civil lawsuit, it's just a complaint saying this is what happened, please look into it. And they take care of it from a point of view of 
should they keep their license or not as a, as a veterinarian. So this has to be pretty serious. This has to be a very be serious, yes. Because I don't want to take away somebody's license if they didn't do anything that was very egregious. The other side of it is the civil lawsuit where I also come in and help them file a lawsuit for the damages to the animal. Now let's take a for instance. An animal will, uh, let's say a dog goes in for teeth cleaning and dies. Now, how does you that happen? You have to wonder how that happens. You have to wonder how that happens. And it's, it's amazing that that does happen. But um, what happened was uh, the, the young dog was not, uh, did not have its blood tested to see if it would clot. It's a very simple test. And you should have your animal tested to see if it will clot for any type of surgery your animal will have. Uh, the teeth cleaning uh, led to uh, bleeding in the mouth and uh, the dog bled to death and because the dog could not clot. They tried infusing blood for, for days and finally the dog died. There's only so many times you can infuse blood into an animal. And the dog passed away. It was a golden retriever, passed away. And the, the owners wanted to go full force with a complaint. And not so much with a lawsuit, I should say. Not so much for the money, but because they felt that if they had just done that simple test that every vet does, that this would not have happened to their little animal, to their little pet. It was a young, a young uh, animal. And it had some oral surgery problems. Um, so it, it did die. Uh, similarly, um, a long time ago, uh, maybe seven years ago, I had a, a monkey that went in for surgery to have its its fangs taken out because as they grow their fangs grow and the owner wanted the fangs taken out um, and also to have the, the uh, animal neutered that which helps calm them it helps calm down the monkey um, she, and it's a little capuchin monkey uh, which she loved dearly and as we all do with our pets <laughs> and um, the animal unfortunately died under anesthesia too much anesthesia was given mm -hmm. and the Poochin monkey passed away. And so that case, the veterinarian decided to settle uh, with the owner of uh, the um, capuchin monkey. And this is not a confidential, there was not a confidentiality agreement signed. So um, it, the monkey, the owner of the monkey received $10,000, which was more than the market value of the capuchin monkey. They usually are valued at about $4,000. Um, I think the vet knew something went wrong and really wanted to uh, make amends for what had happened and also to stay out of, out of court and stay out of the, off the television stations. And it's such a good reason not to get an exotic animal as a pet because oh, I mean, there's a lot of reasons right. not to do it, but probably one of the most important is finding a vet who understands these exotic animals and has enough experience to know the kinds of things that can go wrong with them. It's very difficult. Carol, you're absolutely right about that. Exotic animals, in my opinion, should not be owned by people who do not know how to take care of exotic animals. Um, and there are very few people that do know how to take care of exotic animals. Um, it's my hope that we do have statutes that prohibit the ownership of exotic animals. Um, and right now it is such that you have a certain license that you can have an exotic animal, but that doesn't mean that you know how to take care of the animal or that the vet knows how to take care of that animal because vets usually see cats and dogs and bunny rabbits and, and the uh, large uh, animal vets see the horses and the cows, but they don't see the monkeys or the boa constrictors or other things like that. Uh, which is a big problem now in the Everglades, the boa constrictors, and so we have an issue there. Um, but uh, another issue that comes up where I spend a, a lot of time is uh, pet trusts. And pet trusts, I was doing uh, before the pet trust statute was enacted, just to help people with their incapacitation or death and what would happen with their animals, money-wise caretaker wise and so I would set up a pet trust and it would have the amount of money left for the animals from uh, the person's life insurance policy or their bank account 
or the sale of their home, wherever they had money, and it doesn't have to be a lot of money, it's just enough to take care of the animal, um, the pet, and you, you, it, when you do a pet trust, you get to say who the caretaker is, or a second caretaker, and I generally tell people, ask the caretaker before we put their name in the trust so that they're not shocked when they get it. <laughs> um, and so, <laughs> do not make me yeah, your neighbor. <laughs> exactly. Don't pick Carol. She's got enough animals. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that way they um, they get the right caretaker and they get enough money to take care of the animals. One caveat is that you cannot leave twelve million dollars to your dog, like Leona Helmsley did. And then what happened in that case was the the children, excuse me, the grandchildren who had been specifically left out of her will decided to contest the will because $12 million for troubles, the dog, was excessive. And the court said, you're right, that is excessive. We're going to limit it to $2 million for troubles, who at that time was about 10 years old, those Maltese. And the grandchildren did receive money under her will when she had specifically said that they weren't going to take under the will. So you can, you can always be uh, surprised at what happens with the court decisions. So my point with that is that when you do, when I do pet trust, I say to people, leave a reasonable amount of money to your animals. Don't leave an unreasonable amount because we don't want to have your will contested or your pet trust contested. There's also an issue of power of attorney that I always ask people who have animals to do a power of attorney at any age of the animal or the person. The power of attorney is a very simple document. It's a one-page document that says, should anything happen to me um, or my husband or my children, I would like my animal to go to, and then they leave the name, and, um, and it provides also for money amount to take care of the animals. Because the moment you pass away or you become incapacitated, then the actual um, the money and the uh, the pet um, um, the uh, excuse me the power of attorney goes into effect immediately. So you have the right to go into the home, you have the right to get the animal, and you do not have the right to take the animal to a, a shelter where it could be put down. There's all these things in the power of attorney that are very important. It's the best, least expensive means of taking care of your animal. Uh, I charge $75 to do a, a, a power of attorney. You were reading my mind. I'm sitting there thinking, you know, it probably doesn't cost that much to do it this. Really and you doesn't. can save yourself so much heart. You really can save yourself a heartache and, and fear um, in your lifetime by knowing, take away that fear by knowing that your animal is being taken care of should anything happen to you. So a power of attorney goes a long way. And you're saying it costs how much? Seventy five dollars. Wow. Yeah. And and it's cheap. That's it a deal. is cheap. <laughs> it is a deal, yeah. Because I want people to have them and, and I want them to be able to use them. So um, I wanted to tell you about um, another case that I have that's going on right now. Um, I try to get animals off of dangerous dog um, classifications. And those are usually dogs that have chased somebody but not bitten them. And they're still classified as dangerous and set for euthanization. Who makes that decision? The county um, makes that decision. Each county has their own animal services, and the county animal services makes the decision. It's usually through a special master. And the special master then makes the decision as to who is going to um, be classified as dangerous and which ones are going to be euthanized. I try to keep them from being euthanized. Um, I use every uh, legal uh, maneuvering there's at, there is out there, due process problems, um, that they didn't follow the statute correctly, uh, that the affidavit isn't signed correctly. Anything that I can find to save the dog. It doesn't mean that I don't think a dog that's, that's shown those propensities shouldn't have to wear a muzzle, I do believe that. I don't believe that they should be put down just for acting like a dog. Um, and if someone accidentally drops the leash and the dog takes off and chases another dog, it shouldn't be put down for that. Now if it kills another animal, 
that's a different story. Or if it severely injures another uh, a human being, that is also a different problem. Um, and I tell the people, most likely your animal will be put down, but we'll fight a good fight. Um, and uh, so anyway, I have two animals, uh, two um, beautiful German Shepherds named Buck and Bill at Mantee um, Animal Services, who we are trying to get uh, freed from. They've been inca incarcerated for a year now. Mm. Uh, they were picked up on December 23rd. And so it's a oh, little right before the holidays. Right before the holidays, and it's just it's been over a year, and we're using a very interesting way of doing it. We're setting up a trust where um, there there is a trustee who's in charge of these animals, and no longer the owner gave up her rights to the trustee, and we are bringing the case against the animal services, the county's animal services, saying that the trustee owns the animals and that they have the right to to have the animals treated fairly and um, without having any medical problems. Now the animals have medical problems. So the two, uh, the, the case is such that we're, we're making it such that the animals are entitled to be treated fairly and with the right uh, veterinary care and things like that. And if they're not, it's a violation of the trust which has been created and the animals should come home. Well, that's unique. That's it's a not very before. novel, yes, it's very novel. Um, oh. And uh, we're about 75% sure that we will prevail on this. Um, we've been working on it for about a month and uh, nonstop, two attorneys, uh, myself and Nancy Greer, and, uh, and we're hoping that we'll get these two beautiful dogs. Um, and they are service dogs on top of that. Mm -hmm. And they're therapy dogs. And therapy dogs are the animals that go to the hospice uh, locations and to hospitals and help people and brighten their day. So we really want Buck and Bill to come home. So oh, how bad that these amazing animals. I, I've seen the way animals are kept when they're kept at the pound and it's oh, just no. tiny little jail cells. They are. And Buck and Bill are best friends and they're actually in completely separate portions of the of the county services um, jail area. Oh, here I was sitting here thinking to myself, well, at least they're probably together. Oh, it's they're not, so not together. Oh, that's awful. It is. And one of them has a very large tumor and has had it for several months. And mm -hmm. they're not getting, he is not getting any treatment. So um, that's mm -hmm. one, that's, a, that's another problem, you know. So, um, Animal law definitely touches on a lot of areas, and we've talked about trusts, we've talked about uh, wills, and we've talked about negligence, um, but you'd be surprised about a certain area of negligence that a lot of people don't realize is groomer negligence. And groomer negligence has to do with when you take your animal to the groomer and you get your animal back and it's, it's harmed in some way. This happens quite often. And it's because the animal is usually uh, harnessed at the neck and the, um, they put the heater on and it blows hot air to dry the animal, but the groomer forgets about the animal and goes on to the next animal. And the animal suffers second to third degree burns. Just from this fan? From these hot fans wow. because they're left on for so long. The dog either dies from heat exhaustion or has the second to third degree burns that have to be treated. Mm. That happens often, and so I have to. I have a lot of cases that I deal with that issue. Uh, similarly, uh, vet techs sometimes forget to turn animals that are on heating pads while they're recovering from surgery, and the heating pads um, are left on too long because the animal is on painkillers and doesn't feel that their skin is being seared oh. by this this uh, pad and they're not moved and turned and things like that. So that's an issue that um, it's hopefully going to be fixed and regulated shortly. But one groomer case I had where the poor dog uh, came back to the owners with a lacerated liver uh, with bruises to the ears and the mouth um, and the lady who was grooming the dog said she dropped it uh, from uh, the table. And the vet said, uh, and the dog unfortunately had to be euthanized uh, because of the lacerated liver. 
and the vet who did the necropsy, uh, which is similar to a, a, a human's autopsy, said that there's no way that that could have happened. That had to have been inflicted by somebody with some object, uh, a hit of some sort with an object. Mm -hmm. um, so we did file suit against um, a large grooming facility um, and the groomer um, herself. So do those things become public records so that if I were looking for a groomer that there's somewhere I could search to see if they've had any kind of a history of abuse or neglect? Unfortunately, there's not anywhere to look yet. Just like you can look up a doctor to see if they have malpractice against them or a veterinarian to see if they have a case that or cases pending about their uh, quality of work, groomers um, and dog walkers and uh, doggy daycare do not have any listing for um, any type of issue that they've had with regard to injuries to the animals that, that stay there. Now, for instance, doggy daycares, um, I had a case with that issue. Uh, the doggy daycare, the, the worst, uh, animals were separated by picket fences, and the picket fences have the tops that were triangular, and they were very sharp and one dog tried to jump over and go to see another dog and was impaled mm -hmm. on the picket fence. Now it did live but um, it lost its left leg and um, part of its entire uh, hip area. Um, so wow. we had to sue the doggy daycare for negligence. Um, and, uh, and so that happens. Um, things that you never think about do happen. Um, when you have a case where the, the uh, garbage collector years ago, uh, this is a case in Florida, which is a, a, the seminal case on uh, punitive damages in Florida, is where the garbage collector took a garbage can and threw it at a little dachshund that was outside. And the dachshund died right in front of the owner. Mm. And in that case, the judges awarded punitive damages. Now, punitive means penalty. Uh, it means that you're being charged for something above and beyond just the cost of the dog. And so the lady that it ha that who owned the dachshund received punitive damages in the amount of $25,000. Now that happened in 1964. And so back then that was quite a lot of money. But the judge... And they were like, no animal law attorneys. And there were no <laughs> animal law attorneys, yes. So I give a lot of credit to the attorney that took this case on. I really do. Um, fantastic uh, attorney and uh, so you, you just never know where your case is going to come from and so I, I probably receive as an animal lawyer two cases a week now I don't take all the cases because I have to weed out the ones that are not negligence it's just that the, the dog died of cancer uh, and the vet tried to do everything they could but the dog still died of cancer because it was an old dog with cancer and I'm sure people are looking for somebody to blame in a case like Absolutely. that where they just, they're hurt. And they're hurt and, and so I sometimes play therapist where I say I'm so sorry but this isn't a case where the vet did something wrong. This is just a case um, where the animal was going to pass anyway. It's just, it was just a matter of time. Um, I also take care of uh, cases involving horses and horse trainers are well known for being fairly uh, harsh with horses. And uh, one particular case, uh, a horse was not doing what the trainer wanted, so the trainer um, overheated the horse, turned its head, and tied its head to as far back as it could to the back legs of the horse. And so the horse had a hard time breathing and uh, subsequently died. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that case, that was a very uh, expensive horse and so that case settled um, and in that amount for settlement it was just it was not just for the amount of the horse but it was also an amount for punitive damages that they put in there because they know that the man did something very bad very wrong that that is not the standard for horse training or for teaching a horse not to do what the horse was doing. Yeah, that makes me wonder um, USDA came to me many years ago with, actually PETA came to me many years ago 
with videotape of a man beating a lion in a circus wagon with a baseball bat. And they said, USDA says that this is the common and proper way to train a lion. What do you think? And of course, I let them know what I thought about it. <laughs> I bet, yeah. But I'm wondering in a case like this, like with the horse or with any of your cases, actually, do you, what kind of experts do you have to call in to say, no, that's not how you train a horse? Are there that's that excellent. That? There are people that do that. Now, with vet malpractice cases, you do not need to have another vet say that that was not the standard of care, as you do with a, with a human. Uh, when you have a human medical malpractice case, it is uh, you do need a, a, a physician to say that is not the standard of care for that uh, doctor to have done that to that human. In a vet case, you just have to bring the case and it has to be a reasonable person's idea of what the standard of care is. So you don't have to have an expert in vet malpractice cases, which is wonderful. Now, yeah, in I cases, it's hard to get vets to speak uh, out against each other. Well, you know, it's hard to get physicians to speak out against each other. It's even harder to get vets to speak out against each other. Similarly, um, attorneys. It's hard to get attorneys to talk about malpractice of other attorneys. Um, but um, with regard to uh, horse training and other uh, issues where someone is a specialist, you do have to have an expert of some sort to say that. And we find them. Um, and they're usually in the same state but in another part of the state so that they don't know each other and so or they don't have a beef against the person so yeah and and beating a tiger with a, uh, a, baseball, a bat. baseball bat is just horrific horrific um, there was one case where uh, and this is where family and domestic violence and animal abuse all come together this man uh, and his and in front of his children took a uh, baseball bat and hit the family's aquarium that was full of the fish and the fish were all on the ground dying and the court uh, wanted to know if that was criminal um, abuse um, and uh, criminal abuse toward the children or toward the animal both very good both of them because the children should not be subjected to seeing their pets die at the hands of an adult um, for no reason. He was very angry, the adult male, and so he hit the, the, the uh, uh, actual aquarium with the baseball bat and all the animals, all the uh, fish died. And the fish were actually named after the children. They, ch they, they chose it, uh, the fish and named them after that. And they took care of those fish. And the court found that there was, they found evidence of domestic violence. They found evidence of um, ch children, uh, violence against children. Um, and they found that there was animal cruelty. Because a fish is considered an animal under the statute, and therefore it is um, animal abuse. A lot of people would say, well, a fish isn't an animal, but the statute says differently. So um, the, wow. the statute says any dumb creature which is great. So uh, it could be, you can take that pretty far. You can say an earthworm or something, but uh, if you step on one, no one's going to come and sue you or take you to jail for that. But Unless it's your child's pet. <laughs> Unless it's, it's your child's pet. Them. Yeah, and it's named after them, exactly. And you behead them or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, that's how cross-reporting has come into effect where the police can cross-report animal abuse that they see on the property while they're investigating domestic violence. And then social workers who are there to see the children can see if there's any animal abuse going on or animal neglect and they can do the same thing. They can cross report it and get someone out there who will say we need to take care of this, such as the county or um, the SPCA or people who do investigations of animal abuse. Are there situations where your client is the animal and not a person? Yes. Where there's... Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, in the case where I'm trying to get Buck and Bill um, out of jail, the, my client is actually the animal. Now, as for other animals, 
that is um, a very new topic that's ha happening right now. Uh, Stephen Weiss, a very well-known uh, animal law attorney, is fighting to have four uh, chimpanzees removed from the cells that they're in and put in sanctuaries. They are in uh, horrible condition and he has filed the lawsuit in the names of these animals, um, of these chimpanzees, and um, he's filed what's called a writ of habeas corpus, which is usually used for prisoners to get out of jail. He's using it to get these, these beautiful animals out of uh, the cells that they're in. The court on the uh, trial court level denied it, but it's going up on appeal. And it's believed that, that they will probably prevail at some point, either at the uh, circuit court level or at the Supreme Court level, where these animals will be able to be named as, uh, as plaintiffs in their own case. And that would be terrific. And that would only happen in cases of higher intelligence um, animals, higher, animals of higher intelligence, such as chimpanzees, apes. Um, uh, orca whales, dolphins, and things like that, so that they can say, um, you know, we we don't belong here. We need to be put somewhere else that's safe and um, and live out their lives in a way that's that they deserve. Yeah. So that's it's an interesting. It's called the Non-Human Rights Project. And it, I don't know anything about law, but I've always assumed that it's really hard to win something on appeal if you didn't right the first time around. But you right. seem uh, pretty confident that this might. So what is happening out there that might make this happen? What's happening is there's a movement in animal law towards making animals, for instance, criminal statutes never existed for the um, abuse of animals. And now every single state has criminal statutes. Uh, they were usually misdemeanors. Then all of a sudden, um, there was this movement to have, back in the 1960s and 70s, to have fe felony statutes for animal cruelty, for, so, for acts that were so egregious that they deserved to have felony um, charges brought. So that movement um, occurred, and almost every state has, in the union, has fe felony charges, which is fantastic. Um, there are now lawsuits that have been filed all over the country on behalf of animals uh, and their owners, and their people are winning their cases. Um, and because animal law is being, it's hard to say this, but animal law is being taken more seriously. Um, and with regard to um, the winning on a, on a higher level, trial courts sometimes don't want to change the law because they're, they're fearful of that. Um, they're the trial court. An appellate court is a different type of court, and they don't have a problem with changing the law as we see it today, nor does the Supreme Court. And that's how we get some of those really great Supreme Court decisions, is because they lost at the trial level, they lost at the second appeal level, they go up to the final appeal level, and they win, because the, it's, it's, the morality of people, it's the concern of people, it's the humanity of people who want to change what's happening with animals. And we've changed from a, an agrarian society to an urban society where we uh, don't see animals as just workhorses. We see animals as pets and parts of families and things like that. And so that's what's really changing animal law. It's an exciting time to be alive, to see yep. the way we are changing our attitudes toward animals in general. It is. It really is, yeah. And things like the ag-gag laws, um, which have been passed, which means that you cannot videotape or um, audio tape any type of um, situation involving farming of um, livestock. Um, and, uh, and that would be uh, such as going into a livestock farm or a slaughterhouse. Um, and that lobby won because it's a very large lobby. They won the passage of that law, but it's being fought in many states because we're saying we have the First Amendment right to see what happens in where our food comes from, where where our, our beef and our chicken and our poultry, um, excuse me, and our uh, pork and things like that, where that comes from and how they're treated. Um, foie gras in many states has been uh, found illegal. You cannot do that um, to those poor animals anymore. Uh, you can't stuff uh, food into their gullet 
um, constantly and then cut them open and take out their liver. Um, it's just terrible. It's just very, very hard. Um, These ag gag laws, I'm thinking, would also kind of extend themselves to anything that could be um, considered farming. So like if you have a tiger farm in your backyard and you don't want people to know how you're abusing your tigers and your cubs, then you would be able to appeal to these Absolutely. Ag -gag laws. E exactly. If you had the right type of, not the right, but if you had the situation where you had the right type of um, certifications or something along those lines, then no, you can't have someone come in and tape in your area. Um, I know people at Big Cat Rescue take pictures and take videotape because they're so fascinated by these gorgeous animals and what they've been through. Um, and that goes to show how well Big Cat Rescue takes care of its animals and that they have nothing to hide. But the animal slaughterhouses have a lot to hide. And there are a lot of movies with undercover video showing this, this abuse that's going on. Um, in the dairy farms and in the agricultural area um, where um, the, the animals are not stunned properly before they're killed um, and things like that. So it's a very unfortunate law. The ag gag law is a very unfortunate law and I'm hoping that someday it will be overturned. I think there's enough people out there that are upset with it. When people find out about it, they're upset about it. I think the way that passed is that people just didn't even know what it meant. Right. And you didn't have um, high-powered, high-funded mm -hmm. stakeholders opposing yes. it. You had a few animal lovers screaming bloody murder. Right. <laughs> Aside from that. It, it, That's an excellent point. And the lobbyists, of course, are all are the Tysons and the Smithfields and all the huge... Um, animal manufacturers um, and they go and uh, they go before the and the Senate and and uh, they talk about how their animals are treated fine and and there's no problem and they have millions of dollars in lobbying fees that they can pay whereas like the Animal Legal Defense Fund they're a wonderful group but they don't have millions of dollars and lots of lobbyists to go in front of the of the Senate and say what they have to say about the fact that ag gag laws should be abolished. Yeah, I know the people that are watching this are people who love Tony, the um, Crop Stop Tiger, and yeah. you just mentioned the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Can you tell them a little bit about how that process has been handled by the Animal Legal Defense Fund and where it stands currently? Sure, uh, Tony, uh, the tiger is has been held in a cage at a rest stop slash uh, gas station area um, and has been exposed to the elements and to uh, gas fumes and to people coming over and throwing things through the bars. He's had a very, very tough life. He's had no social socialization and the Animal Legal Defense Fund finally got standing to bring a lawsuit against the owners of Tony the Tiger. And the, that took a long time because um, to get standing you have to show that you have a cause that you are a group that uh, specializes in animal welfare and of course the Animal Legal Defense Fund does have that. They got standing, they filed the lawsuit. Um, Tony the Tiger um, on the trial level was found to be um, in good condition in their eyes. They had inspectors go out and that they denied uh, the petition for the injunction for Tony the Tiger to be let out of the, uh, well, the cell that he lives in. Um, on appeal, uh, the judges found differently and found that he should be uh, let free and to go and live in a, in a sanctuary somewhere to live out his life. Um, they are appealing it. The owners of Tony the Tiger are appealing it and we'll have to see what happens. I find that in my mind that Tony will be set free and uh, if not sooner then later, I'm hoping sooner and that he will go to a beautiful place to spend out the rest of his life. Well, would be wonderful. It would be wonderful because it is such a tragedy what has happened to, to Tony and to other animals in the circus and, and other places like that that 
um, uh, I don't want to say abuse animals, but uh, there is abuse that's going on behind the scenes. And so um, you uh, just want him to be, these animals to be freed from what they have been going through. And this legal process started in 2009, so it really takes a long time sometimes by the time you work your way through the, the court and the appellate court and the district court and the exactly. state court. Exactly. <laughs> You're absolutely right. It does, legal uh, things take a long time. Legal aspects can take upwards of five or six years. And with Tony the Tiger, 2009, and we're, we're just turned into 2014, and uh, we still don't have a decision yet. And uh, hopefully the decision will be soon. Um, uh, there are the same thing with puppy mills. You know the puppy mills there. You know that people have investigated and found undercover video of the puppy mills and the animals being treated cruelly. And it takes so long to get the court to say, yes, uh, the Humane Society has the right to go in and get all those beautiful animals and to take care of them and the owner has to relinquish title and ownership to all the animals that they've been treating so poorly. And, and so we, we just, we have to follow the law in order to prevail. People ask us all the time, why can't you just go in and rescue that animal? Why can't you just go oh. take Tony? It's like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> right. And it would be considered stealing uh, and, and you would, not you personally, but someone who took Tony would be charged with theft and it's a sad thing um, that we can't just go and open the, the door and put him in a car and take him away, take Tony away somewhere. But we do have to follow the law and uh, sometimes the law works perfectly for us and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and so animals are considered property um, and as property you own the animal, other people own their animals, you can't go and just take the animal, like the animal in the backyard that's being abused, um, unless yeah, I it's. I wonder if that would change if the animals had personhood. It would definitely change because then you could bring the lawsuit in the name of the animal, list out all the things that those people were doing badly to this animal, and then the the judge would make a decision or the jury would make a decision on should this animal be freed or not. In the animals, <laughs> that would be terrific. It would be wonderful if we could bring the, the things in the name of animals. You talked about something, um, this is much earlier, but um, one other an animal law that's out there that's happening in the state of Florida and around the country is uh, anti-tethering laws where you, you know, you don't, where you see those poor dogs tethered outside and on leashes and and their bone, you know, they may have a little bone, but their bowl is too far away and they can't get their water. And if they're fed, you know, maybe once a week, that's good enough for their owners. So you know it's animal abuse. Well, uh, the, the state of Florida is trying to get all of the counties to have what's called anti-tethering laws where the animal cannot be put outside for longer than, let's say, an hour. Some counties different. It can be two hours. Um, if it's longer, you must be outside with the animal. Um, if it's a shorter span, the animal has to be inside. It cannot be left outside unattended. Um, and it's, it's great. A lot of, of counties have passed this, this uh, ordinance, and I love it. It's, it's so great to see so many people caring that the animals get to stay inside or in a, an enclosure of some sort where they're not left to the elements. And an animal that's tethered also doesn't make a good protection animal because their territory is that little area where they're kept. And so the house... Crooks are probably smart enough to uh, yeah. see how far that extends. That goes this far <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the animal isn't a, isn't, uh, doesn't have an affiliation with the house so it doesn't think that, that's any, that it's that property of the, the animal. And yes, also, that's not my job. That's not my job. <laughs> exactly. I love it. That's not my job. Somebody else can take care of that. And then also, the animals are um, unfortunately subjected to being beaten up by people, uh, being abused by people, or being abused and killed by other animals, by roaming animals, because it's chained up. Um, or they try and jump a fence and they hang themselves. Um, and uh, it's 
I've done a lot of speaking um, in front of the county commissioners about the anti-tethering laws, and I have a, a whole uh, a PowerPoint on it that really moves them because it shows some of the egregious things that happen to animals when they're tethered, and uh, it's a it's a very bad situation. And thankfully, I, we're changing it. I actually testified in that, it, it, although I almost never step outside of if it's not a cat, I'm not going to be involved in it. Right. But this one I did because back in 1980, when my daughter was born. There was a Siberian Husky that had been chained to a tree near where I lived, oh. and that dog was always wrapped up in the chain up against the tree because he'd just run around the tree, run around the tree until he was completely chained to the tree and exactly. then he couldn't move. Exactly. And finally, one day I just had enough of it. I wrote a note to the owner, pinned it to the tree, and I went and cut the dog loose, and the oh. chain around his neck had actually grown into the skin. Oh and my it was gosh. surgically removed. It was so embedded in this poor dog that's so emaciated in such awful condition. But when you talk about the service dog, when my daughter learned to walk, she learned to walk by holding on to the dog. And oh. he would walk her all through the house. And um, it was Sally Spada. Do you remember her? No, I don't. I she don't. was like an early anti-tethering back in the 80s. Was well, she really? Person. Oh, great. If you go into the Humane Society's clinic, they okay. have a big tile for her. And that's the only thing I knew about her was her position on anti-tethering, which took years. Those Look how long it laws. took. Yeah, exactly. The recent laws. Exactly. And uh, the my PowerPoint presentation that I showed to county commissioners um, or anyone that wants to see it shows pictures of the actual chain so embedded that so many times they have to go ahead and uh, surgically remove it, and it's so painful that it's grown into their skin and into their flesh um, because I can't imagine. Every time no one's moved, moved, on that. no one's made it bigger for them as they've grown, as the animal has grown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a great law. It's a wonderful law. So. Tell us about what you are doing to teach others to do what you do. What I'm doing, I um, I teach at Stetson, and I teach the students not only about animal law and the statutes, but I teach them how to be animal lawyers. And so they they uh, help me with cases. I ask their opinions on that. Um, they will write things for me, um, and I'll show them how they need to make it a little bit better. Um, and so I'm trying to get another generation of animal lawyers out there. How wonderful. The more the better and we just need so many more animal lawyers and also I go to high schools and speak at high schools and teach them that if you decide to go to law school here's an idea um, it may not be your first job or your second job but somewhere along the line you can actually become an animal lawyer like I did um, I think kids don't even think of that as being an option not at we, all we don't have any role models out there well, I shouldn't say we don't have any. We have so few role models yes. that we even know of. Right, and they, they don't realize that it's an option, and even students in law school don't realize it's an option. I'm also in charge of the Student Animal Legal Defense Fund at Stetson, which is uh, affiliated with the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and those we have about 60 members, and so I speak to them about how to open your own practice and how to get clients and things like that. Um, and it's wonderful uh, to get that, that many people involved. So I do speak to, uh, I speak to younger groups such as um, uh, elementary school, but I do it on a, um, a different level because I don't want to show them all the graphic things. But I want to teach them about goodness to animals and kindness and things like that. But um, I do teach uh, at high schools and universities and, um, of course, I teach at the law school. Um, and any bar association, I, I've had so many bar associations throughout the state ask me to speak, and people come up afterward and say, I've, I've never heard of animal law, and you've really opened my eyes to that. And I tell them, if you get this in your practice, call me. I will give you my, my um, motions, um, anything I've ever written, my complaints, and you can, I basically tell them, you can plagiarize them <laughs> and use them for your own so that you can help that animal that's out there that needs to help. Uh, I find the animal law people stick together. 
animal lovers um, stick together and help each other out. So, okay. yeah, it's it's a wonderful feeling. So, um, the more animal lawyers we get out there, the better it is for the animals. Yeah. Well, we're down to our last couple of minutes. Okay. Are there things um, as you're thinking back over all of the topics that you covered? Anything that you want to add? Uh, I'd like to talk about a case um, that goes to show you never know what's going to happen. Um, a large company puts in garage doors and here in, uh, in Odessa, I don't, I don't mean here, but in Odessa, a man put in a new garage door and uh, when you put in new garage doors they have sensors where the garage door stops so that if something's blocking the garage door, the garage from shutting, the garage door from shutting, it will stop so that uh, such as a child will not, the door won't shut on that uh, child or the bicycle or something along those lines. Well, this man left for work and um, his cat, he shut the garage door and drove off. His cat was coming out from under the garage door and was uh, crushed by the garage door. Uh, his neighbors called him at work. Unfortunately, the cat was still alive when oh. he came home. Oh, yeah, it was very sad. So um, they, they euthanized the cat. But the problem was the garage door shut so low to the ground that it crushed the cat. Now, if it had been a child or something, it would have obviously killed the child or, or seriously hurt the child. The manufacturers had put the, the sensors in too low, and so that's how this cat was crushed. Mm -hmm. And so we had to go ahead and uh, uh, we couldn't get anywhere with the manufacturer or the installers of the the sensors. So we had to file a lawsuit, which is usually the last thing I do. I try and negotiate and then I try to, then we go forward with the lawsuit. And we sued um, the garage door uh, uh, makers and also the garage door in, um, installers of the uh, um, sensors. Um, and we fought the good fight and uh, the jury came back and said, um, you were both negligent and um, we are going to award amount of money to the uh, uh, to my client for the cost of the animal which was he was a stray cat that he picked up so they gave him ten dollars for that and gave him fifteen thousand dollars for emotional distress wow. which was wonderful so it, it was um, really to teach them please be careful with where you put the sensors. And, um, and I bet most of your clients are not really suing for the money because the money can't bring the animal back. It's no. because they don't want that to happen again. You're absolutely right. They are not looking for the money. They aren't. There isn't a lot of money in it. They are looking to keep it from happening again and to in their own feelings of justice that they did something to help um, in the future. Something that really impressed me about you was that you told me how you decide which side of a case to represent. Right. Right. Tell our viewers. Okay. <laughs> um, I always pick the side that, I call it the animal side. Um, and the reason I say that is because the animal um, that has been abused or neglected or the person who has the, wants to get custody. I always look to see who is going to prevail, who in my heart deserves to have the case taken to court or the, the, the animal brought back to them through a custody battle. In a trust case, everybody wins, so I don't have to worry about that. But um, in a case with a vet, let's say, in my heart of hearts, I think, did the vet really do the very best job he or she could do? And so I have, uh, it's called, it's just a moral compass. And so um, if the animal uh, really did suffer and it was wrong for it to suffer, I take that case. Now that means that I would say 50% of my cases that get called in or emailed, I, I don't take. But the 50 that I do, I'm trying to change the law and I'm trying to help the owners. 
um, to have some satisfaction that their animal didn't die in vain. So that it's, a, it's really a moral compass type of issue. And I was also impressed that you go out of your way to help these professionals do their job better by telling them these are some of the things you really need to be watching out for. That's excellent. Um, I'm so glad you brought that up. I do talk to veterinarian groups and to the University of Florida's Veterinary College and I tell them these are some issues that happen over and over again in my practice and the reason I'm speaking to those groups is to show them please keep an eye on this and keep an eye on the, the warming pads or the anesthesia or something along those lines where I've seen this happen and uh, we want to protect the vets so that they don't ever have to see me. I love that. I just don't want them to have to see me. <laughs> well, I'm so glad our viewers got to see you. Thank you so much for inviting me. And in case anybody doesn't know, this is being taped on New Year's Day. Yes. So it's a lovely you. new year, yes. <laughs> thank you so much for coming out on your vacation. Thank party. you, Carol. Thank you. And thank you for what you do for, for the big cats. I, I love bringing my students here. Um, this is the highlight of the semester for my students. <laughs> well, thank you. So that's been Cat Chat 36. You can join us at thecatchatshow.com and find links to the show and other shows. See you later. <laughs>